Dr. Sarah Robinson. And so in my second day, I was finally brought into the Lindquist Gallery, which is what you see behind you. I finally convinced Mr. Mark Lindquist to get on camera, which was no small feat. And we are, we're here in his gallery, which has a ton of spalted wood in it. So um, I have, I have so many questions um, that I didn't, when I first interviewed you on the phone a couple of years ago now, I was one, completely overwhelmed that you would even talk to me. And two, then you gave so much information. And, uh, and we're, we're gonna have a bit of a conversation, which I think would be really, I think it'd be really good. It's such an important story because it fills in a gap that we had. I wasn't sure how many woodworkers I was gonna have to interview to figure out what had happened. Because we had the old history, um, and that was uh, also partially due to my co-author, Hans Mikkelsen, who's an art restorer in Germany. He's worked on a lot of these old pieces, and so he knew about them. And so we had that chunk, um, and we were able to, to do a lot of uh, going around Europe and looking at old churches and stuff. And then there was just sort of this, well, what happened? Like, what, how, did, how, did, how was it so important for hundreds of years? And then nothing. And then this, and then your story with Mel and you, it was just, that's what happened. That's how it came here. And that's how it kind of got distorted a little bit in translation because it, it didn't come over. It, it happened naturally. It just sort of organically sprung up again, which was a cool story. Well, it is a cool story. And what's, what's also really cool about it is to think that really for Mel, where things happened was in Alaska you know, where, where beavers had cut down trees for dams, and I'm talking about big trees, and the, those trees became spalted, and he saw that, and so he kind of had an inkling of what, you know, he, he never knew what it was, but he knew that it was. And then when, it, when that happened uh, on, on, you know, blazing the trail, that he saw it, it reminded him instantly, oh yeah, that's that stuff. I haven't seen that since Alaska, mm -hmm. and wow, I'm going to do something with this. So, uh, you know, and his, his doing that stuff, he'd had a heart attack and, and retired from General Electric, you know, at, at a certain point, and he began getting out there. And it just coincided that uh, you know, people were making and selling things at uh, little craft shops throughout the country, and they were called boutiques at the time. And um, then the craft fairs uh, started springing up, and there were a lot of craft fairs in the area. Uh, um, Washington Park in Troy, New York, Fox Hollow, which was a folk festival, and that's what that's what it would be. Is that you know you you go to these music happening type things and, and then the craftspeople would be out in the woods. That was the there. era too though. I mean that, that yeah. 60s and 70s, that was very much what was going on with yeah, the US. Yeah, particularly with Woodstock yeah. and things like that. You know, you had people making sandals at, at Woodstock and selling them and just, like, belts and things like that. The perfect storm of coincidences because mm. He, he could have discovered spalted wood and it could have been a time where everyone wanted things made out of aluminum. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about growing up with Mel. Sure. I always felt proprietary about spalted wood. It was something I grew up with, you know. It was, it was something that uh, I felt, you know, my father and I had discovered. We, we, of course, we didn't invent spalted wood, but, but we... You rediscovered it. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we, we discovered it for ourselves mm -hmm. on, on his land, and then Mel made something out of it, and I followed suit, you know. And Mel was, um, he was in the army, he was a, a surveyor and a, and a cartographer. And he was in Alaska, and he was like uh, a woodsman and an outdoorsman. And he would go off uh, in Alaska for weeks on end with just a pup tent and a, uh, a two-man saw over his shoulder, and he would do surveying and, and map making for the army. And he loved being in the outdoors. And when he transferred with General Electric, um, to uh, Schenectady, New York, uh, with uh, he he bought uh, close to a hundred acres of land in the upstate New York Adirondacks, 
And so every weekend we went up there and we worked on camp. We always called it camp. And uh, went out into the woods and uh, there was a time when Mel uh, cut through a white birch tree uh, making a trail. He was big on making trails. That's what you do in forestry. You make trails. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he cut, he cut into the white birch tree and it was just full of black lines and he called them watermarked lines. And I could see the look in his eyes. He just, you know, his eyes got wide and he said, Oh, we're going to take these back to camp. And, uh, you know, this is like, in 1959, 1960, and... So you were 10? Yeah, I was 10 years old. Uh, and he was amazing because he let me just do about anything. He put a chainsaw in my hands when I was 10 years old and said, oh, go cut those things down. And didn't show me how to do it much. He, I watched him and I saw how to do it. And, and I, would, I would work with him. We built log cabins and he did show me how to you know, skive the logs and make one log fit into another. I mostly spent my time making things because that's what uh, Mel did. He was a great role model. Someone came up to me and said, you sure picked the right father. It was uh, really an amazing upbringing, learning about the woods, learning about the forest, learning about the trees always getting trees that were downed, never really cutting live trees, um, just forced conservation in a way. And I think one of the things that is perhaps not as well understood or really appreciated about spalted wood is, is the role it played in shaping wood turning. Um, you can't really have a conversation about wood turning in the United States and its evolution without discussing spalted wood as much as some people might like to do so. So up until about the 60s, wood turning was, it, it wasn't nearly as pervasive as it is now. And it was very much, things had to be perfect. So they had to be straight grained and they had to be perfectly formed. And you know, there was no live edge stuff happening. It was all, it was perfection. And then the linguists hit the scene and all of a sudden we were, we were getting, you know, different things. There were um, all these crazy colors. There was rot. I mean, who puts rot in their wood? Um, and, and everything started, they, they started doing this and then they were doing different things, craft shows, art shows, these types of things. And it, and it, and it literally like split wood turning in a whole different direction. At the time that spalted wood happened, uh, it was written in Fine Woodworking Magazine that Mark and Melvin Lindquist unleashed spalted wood upon the world. Definitely so, unleashed it on North America. It was like the Big Bang. Uh, James Krenoff was using spalted wood and we were friends as well. Um, and he was just a great guy. Um, it, it revolutionized wood turning. And all of a sudden, things didn't have to be straight grained. The, the public consciousness entirely, it, their acceptance of it, just completely did, it did a 180. And all of a sudden, now straight just wasn't, you know, straight um, perfect pieces were, were on the out. And all of a sudden, it was spalted was hot. <laughs> these things that were different um, became so important and and in a way that 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 freed wood turning a little bit and it, it made it it made it into something that wasn't so rigidly controlled <laughs> Thank you.
about that's that's kind of what spalting is, right? It's you, even with all the science we have now, you can't control it. You can direct it, but you can't control it. And and so it's it's so neat that that spalting and wood turning, at least in the U.S., really they really evolved together and and changed the whole dialogue of wood turning. And and that's what the Linquists did. You know, when you see Mark and Mill's pieces and when you see them in in museums, you know, at the Met, at the Smithsonian, and and you take a look at them, you know, I've seen interesting reactions to them, but there's so much context you're missing in that this was not done. This was not a thing. When you look at one of their pieces, it's so different than what had come before in terms of texture, in terms of spalting, in terms of live edge, in terms of grain that is not proper. That is the significance of that piece, that it was a completely different discourse. It was, it was a, you know, two people being willing to change the conversation entirely and say, I don't really care that, that this is what proper turning is. This is what I want to do. And, and it just, it changed, it changed everything. And we're still, we, we still have that battle. I mean, if you're a wood turner, you know that battle, you go to turning groups, um, or you go to symposiums and, and there's still a divide almost between this is the correct way to turn. This is how you should have your gouge. Um, you know, this is always don't turn end grain, turn side grain or, or whatever people say. And then you've got the person who's, you know, using a, a shank of metal. They ground themselves and going into a bowl that's not centered. And, and they're doing something that's completely a different dialogue. Or, I mean, even today, people still fight against spalted wood. There's still a lot of chatter about, is spalted wood going to kill me? Is spalted wood too dangerous to turn? Is it going to blow up on the lathe? I mean, it's, it's still there. It's still butting up against convention, like every time. And, and I love that about spalted wood, that it's, it's always something that people kind of think, oh, that's cool, but should you? Like, it, it's, it's always there. And, and it's great that that started with the linguists and made it, made it so much more acceptable, I guess, to, to explore wood and, and the different parts of wood that weren't just perfect. There's nothing in this world that's perfect. Uh, you can look at yourself or you can look at your, your neighbor or you could look at, uh, look at uh, whoever you want to. And there's some imperfections in these piece, people. Now, as far as I'm concerned, wood has imperfections in it, and, and they're just like people. Uh, wood is just, just like people. And if you can bring out the beauty of this, uh, people with imperfections are, gr are great people. I was the first one to use spalted wood as a medium for turning uh, vases and bowls and this sort of thing up until I started doing it. No one would dare to touch this stuff. Here's an old piece of wood, you know, and it doesn't look like much, but when you get through with it, hey, it can be real pretty.
and short of it is, is that I'm, I'm fairly reclusive, as most people know. But what? I found you. I yes, found you. yes. And that indeed. <laughs> no small feat. So you're welcome, Internet. <laughs>